a very warm welcome to everyone joining us online for Henley and Partners Global webcast on their recently launched inaugural Henley Education Report, which also includes a pioneering new index, the Henley Opportunity Index, which we will be hearing about in a few moments. But first up, let's get the introductions done. I'm Juliette Foster, and it really gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce our panel of experts. They have their work cut out for them in our time together, because what they're going to do is to help us unpack how a first class education combined with expanded global access rights creates significant opportunities for next, the next generation in terms of growing their global networks, maximizing their career prospects, increasing their earning potential, and of course, boosting their economic mobility for greater success and prosperity across their lifetimes. It's a big to-do list, but I guarantee we will get through it. So let's start by meeting our panel. First up, I'd like to introduce Tess Wilkinson. Tess, it's very good to see you. Tess is the Director of Education Services, Henley and Partners. Welcome. Let's Thank extend you. the thanks to Scott Moore. Now, Scott is the Managing Director of the Philippines and Indonesia for Henley and Partners. So, Scott, it's very good to see you. You're actually in Japan at the moment. Is that correct? Scott, can you hear me? That's right. Yeah, you are in Japan. Excellent. I was just testing the link there just to make sure that our audio was working. It's good to know that it is. Also, let's welcome Dr. Jose Caballero. Now, he is the senior economist at the IMD World Competitiveness Center, which is based in Lausanne in Switzerland. So, Dr. Caballero, welcome. It's very good to see you. Thank you. Alistair Montgomery is the co-founder and managing director at Academic Profiling Tests. Good to see you, Alistair. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good morning. Excellent. Good morning to you. Good morning from London. <laughs> and also Peter Ferrino, he's the Director of Tax Services at Henley and Partners. It's good to see you too. Thank you so much for joining us. In thank fact, you. I'd like to say thank you to all of you because I know that you're very busy and we appreciate the fact that you have taken time out of your busy schedules to be part of this conversation. Now we're going to kick things off with a presentation. It's going to be given to us by Scott. And what he's going to do is give us a short but very detailed overview of the key takeouts from that groundbreaking Henley Education Report and of course the Henley Opportunity Index, which I referenced a few moments ago. So Scott, the floor is yours. You have five minutes on your presentation, five minutes. Thank you, Juliet. And Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our audience, depending on where you're tuning in from. Again, my name is Scott Moore. I'm leading the Southeast Asian region for Henley & Partners, and it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to discuss the latest Henley & Partners report on education, which coincides with our Global Opportunity Index. Henley & Partners is a global leader in investment migration, um, and we have clients that come to us with the objective often to create better opportunities for the next generation, whether through greater global access or as a hedge against potential future domestic or global instability. Investment migration and building a portfolio of residents and citizenships is a crucial part of wealth and succession planning. If we go to the next slide, um, when we're thinking of the next generation, of course, education is top of mind. Data clearly shows that higher education levels correlates with substantially higher uh, earning potential. According to Eurostat, those with tertiary qualifications in the European Union earn about 50% more than those with secondary education, a massive 70% more than those with lower education. This wage premium for university degrees and skills is even more pronounced with certain countries. In Portugal, for example, a highly educated individual earns three times more than those with basic education. Realizing the salary uplift requires more than just an isolated degree. Research shows over two thirds of income variation between individuals globally is simply attributed to the country in which they live and work. Investment migration can combine residents or citizenship rights along with high quality of education, helping bridge the geographical income gap and provide more security for a family's future through domicile diversification. Economist Branko Milavnik explains, if you want to be rich, you'd better be born in a rich country or immigrate there. 
He estimates 50 to 60 percent of global inequality is simply due to the differences in countries' average incomes. Therefore, accessing opportunities in more developed economies can have an outsized impact on earning potential and standard of living. This concept underpins the new Henley Opportunity Index, a proprietary benchmarking of how first class education and expanded access drives success. Wealthy families are focused on securing their heirs' fortunes and understanding that truly future proofing their legacies requires access to the world's best opportunities through multiple domiciles. If we go to the next slide, Henley and Partners research shows future millionaires increasingly expect multi-jurisdictional lifestyles, flexible residences, rights, and attending the leading universities in different countries. Yet education is only the beginning. With second passports and multiple residence rights opening access to varied business cultures, funding ecosystems, and innovation hubs necessary for young entrepreneurs to thrive internationally. And if we just look at the last slide, we can see the opportunity index. So before we start our panel discussion, you can see the index combines uh, scores alongside the metrics of earning potential, career advancement, top tier employment prospects, premium education, economic mobility, and livability. All of these countries have either a residence or citizenship by investment program. And combined with education, this creates long lasting benefits for future generations. Henley and Partners has offices in 13 of the 15 of these countries to be attentive to our client specific needs. And we also offer comprehensive education advisory services to help families better capture educational opportunities in all of these countries, whether for tertiary or post-secondary options. And with that, Juliet, we can move on to our panel discussion. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that presentation, Scott. It really was very detailed. Lots of food for thought there. But before we actually get down to the nitty gritty, I want to remind you, our online audience, that we want you to be part of this webcast. We want your contributions to the conversation. So if there are any questions or indeed observations that you would like to put to members of the panel, you can do that using the Q&A function on Zoom. And I guarantee that we will try to answer as many of your questions as we can at the end of this this panel. Let's kick it off because somebody has to draw the short straw. Tess, you will be <laughs> delighted to know that it is you. You've got the first question. That's an honour and a privilege. But look, Henley and Partners, as we know, it has pioneered investment migration. It's also recognised as the global leader in residence and citizenship by investment. So perhaps you can explain to us why the firm has decided to actually move into the education space, because perhaps that does seem slightly incompatible with what it is known for. Yes, thanks, Julia. Um, it's a very good question. And in fact, it's a very logical step for Henley because they identified a while back that many of their clients were asking for detailed information about possible schools and also tertiary education before deciding on residency or citizenship programs. And it became clear that as these results increased, uh, requests increased in number, there just wasn't enough expert information for them available. It was quite disjointed and largely depended on whether or not the client's advisor knew somebody who could assist them. Therefore, um, we started working um, with these clients and our core team are all educators and worked in international education for 25 years. And therefore we can help families who are considering investment migration programs and those who just want standalone advice, who need support to navigate the complexities of international education. And when coming from other countries and systems, it can be simply overwhelming. Mm, so it's a logical transition and you're, you're absolutely yeah. right when you say it is overwhelming because we will be looking at some of the, the hurdles that need to be crossed. But Alistair, <laughs> what I want to put to you is that, look, every parent, they understand that if you're going to invest in your child, you make sure they get the best possible education because ultimately it will empower them, certainly as they get older. But in terms of planning ahead, how early should parents actually start thinking about the educational aspirations they may have 
for their kids? Is there an ideal time? Because you know what, you can plan today, but you may have to compromise those plans in five or 10 years time. Nobody, unfortunately, has a grasp on the future in terms of what's going to happen. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And the, the easy answer to that question is that you can't start too early when thinking about your child's education and their trajectory in, what, in, in where they're heading. Um, at the same time, it's also never too late to start engaging with where your child is at educationally um, and what support you can put in around them in order to get to the places that they want to get to. So I think it, we, we're in a, um, a world now where the um, education choices for your children is much more open than it ever used to be, it's particularly if parents are financially mobile um, and they can really access all kinds of opportunities from the earliest part of their children's education today. But I guess the flip side of that is that, yes, there is plenty of choice. And if you have you can have more choice if you are financially mobile. But how can you feel confident that you're making the right decisions? Because, again, it comes back to the point which I made before that something which seems logical today might not stand up so many years down the line. Absolutely. And this is where uh, we um, education professionals really support the idea of um, surrounding yourself with experts, with people who can support that journey, support you as a family in terms of where you are wanting to head and the sort of um, aspirations you have for your children. We also recognize and encourage um, the use of good data um, in looking at uh, your child's academic abilities, starting early and following their, um, their progress through school and knowing that they, you can put in interventions as and when necessary um should should they be required on and to keep your child on track um as, as you move forward and it's that it's that data point which i think is really really useful using um, assessments and data and absolutely but now we are going to look at the data issue because i mean that's that's quite fascinating in itself but another point which i want to put to you is about the concept of finding the right school or college how does that impact on the learning trajectory of a child well one of the, the phrases that we often use is that uh, uh, happy children thrive um, in the right environment, um, but stressed students struggle. Um, and the, the, the answer there is really that finding the right environment is going to help your child uh, uh, really achieve their academic potential. Um, all too often, um, we see students um, are perhaps not pushed hard enough um, 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 in the school environment, if it, if, it, if it isn't academically challenging enough for them, they might fail to, to meet some of those, some of those um, uh, standards that they are fully capable of, of meeting. Um, and vice versa, school st students who work very, 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 very hard to get into an, an academically um, competitive environment, but then really struggle um, to keep up with the pace if the, if the academic rigor is too hard for them. So finding that right place is so important to allow a child to meet their, their, their potential. Mm. Um, and that's where support can really help. OK, now we're, now we're going to look at, look at data, because look, we know that Henley and Partners, they actually offer the Henley Academic Profiling Assessment, otherwise known as a HAPA, H-A-P-A. Now, we know it's an online assessment tool which gives a comprehensive evaluation of a child's academic skills. Now, you are an academic profiling expert. So can you actually take us through this journey of unpacking how parents can best use the academic data provided by HAPA and education experts when they're actually speaking to a child's existing school or college, because I would imagine there's, there has to be an element of diplomacy involved in this as well, because you, you could have a recipe there for a real conflict between the data and teachers. Absolutely. And the last thing we ever want to do is for parents to march into their school shaking a piece of paper saying um, this says this about my child and it's not the message that we're getting from you absolutely not this is very much to help build a team around your child and around your child's education and work with the existing school um, having um, a, a profile um, of the child's academic abilities hand in hand with what the school is talking back to the parent with um, with what they're observing in, in the classroom and in that child's learning trajectory and helping that dialogue of understanding between the team around that child really work together. Um, and we find that that really creates the best outcomes 
um, for the child going forward. So we don't want to cause conflict, absolutely not. Um, we want to um, help coach families in talking to their schools in order to get the best for their children. OK, Tess, come back into the conversation, because, look, there are many people who are listening to this webcast. They have children, so they're actually confronting some of these these very real issues that we've been discussing, or perhaps they're, they're thinking of, of having families. But look, the key thing for them is understanding what goes into the planning phase when it comes to making sure that their child gets into one of the top global universities. It may not be an issue now if a child is quite small, but time waits for no man or woman, so they could be facing this conversation in another 10 years time or whatever, according to how old their child is. So what advice would you give to parents who are currently facing this issue or those for whom it is an issue that is yet to come in terms of the planning phase? Well, firstly, I'm just going to second what uh, Alistair said in that planning is always the first thing I'll say whenever I talk to parents, because especially since um, since COVID, there's really been a significant shift and we've seen schools and universities become increasingly difficult to get into. And with regards to the different regions, depending on where students are going to um, study the most complex by far is the US. So I try to talk to uh, encourage parents to give their children at least two years, if possible, to do all the preparation. Because if you're looking at an Ivy League or other top colleges in the States like MIT or NYU, then you really need to know that you're applying to a community. You're not applying to a course. It's not like the UK or like Australia. And you need to demonstrate your fit that you fit their community and that when they look at you, they see the right person for them. And that involves a lot of work. So going to summer camps, reading, researching and developing additional interests. So when the admissions team read your application, they say, yes, I want that person. So it, it, it's a huge amount of work for the states. Um, if they're looking at the UK, Canada, Australia, I would say between a year to 18 months is a really good sort of lead time but all the way through school all the way you know if if they are ambitious children if they have competence and they have aspirations and they're clear on their aspirations they can really work on just developing themselves which is good anyway for children and and get a wide range of interests to help them it sounds so simple the way that you put it, but of course it's, it is very difficult, but that's why you have this fantastic support network offered by Henley and Partners, because they're mm. basically helping parents through this journey. But Scott, you started this, and I mean this in the, in the, in the politest possible way, because you really laid out the figures in terms, and also the, the countries where you, you, you can actually have this marriage between investment, etc., and also a good education. But look, listening to Tess, listening to Alistair, what we've got here is an idea of what it is required or what is required if you want your child to go into some of the most prestigious institutions around. What I want you to do is expand on why Henley and Partners is actually emphasizing the value of investment migration as opposed to going down the international student visa route because I'm sure that for many parents, the latter would be the most obvious course of action. So, Julia, when you're going overseas to school, of course, you can get a student visa, uh, but it's important to recognize that that serves no time towards permanence. For a, a child that wants to continue on after university, perhaps they want to gain some work experience, they would need to find an employer to sponsor them after they graduate unless the family has planned ahead and they have applied for a residence visa through investment. Also, when they are going to undergraduate school, the degree will probably take up to upwards of four years. This is time that if they are studying as a local resident, they can be naturalizing and they can be working towards a passport. So they could potentially graduate with a degree and a passport. None of these things are possible under a student visa. So there's more flexibility effectively away from the student visa format. But look, there might also be viewers whose children are already studying overseas. So given that, is it too late for them, for example, to consider investment mi migration programs or is there, 
is is this open ended? It doesn't really matter when you join as long as you do. Yeah, great question. I mean, a lot of the degrees, whether they're masters, whether they're undergraduate, they do take quite a bit of time. So you can uh, file for a change in status once you've applied for the program itself. Um, the top countries where people want to study overseas for school, generally Australia, UK, uh, Canada, United States, some of these countries do take quite a while to be approved for the investor migration visas, maybe upwards of two to three years. But in specific cases, like with the United States EB-5 program, for example, the uh, family can invest 800,000 US dollars for the child and the child can file for a change in status. And in a lot of cases within six months, the change in status will allow the child to work in any job that they want in the US. So we can always work with the families and try and find the best, most flexible approach that will fit the student's needs. Okay, there are tax implications, of course. And Peter, that's where you come into the conversation because look, for parents who choose to send their children to another country to pursue their studies, there are tax issues which they need to think about. So under what circumstances should they worry about tax? Can you unmute yourself, please, Peter? Peter, I don't know if you can hear me, but you're they're yeah. wonderful. wonderful. Was, we missed the beginning of what you said. So if you could take it back, please. Yes, um, that is a very good question. I think you know, students, if you're living and working and studying in the country, obviously, but they're subject to the same tax rules as everybody else. There may be certain things around scholarships being tax exempt, and that's a country specific rule. But I think when you look at the bigger issues, then obviously there's the financial maintenance and support they come from that comes from the parents or the family. And again, in most cases, that shouldn't be taxable. But there, if you're going down the investment migration route or buying a property, then care and consideration needs to be given to that. Um, because investment migration is making the investment. Investments should have a return. And if, you know, a classic example we've seen is where parents buy a property for the child to live in and they rent rooms to the uh, uh, other students. And again, people don't always think about the taxable income, but they don't always think that if the property is in the parent's name does the, and they keep a spare room for when they come and visit, have they given themselves available accommodation, which suddenly makes the parent potentially tax resident in that country. And if the property gets sold at the end of the student period, then who has the capital gain? And if it's in the parent's name and not the students, can they have the exemptions for private residence? So it can get very messy very quickly, but it's all very avoidable with planning up front. Mm. It's interesting there, the example that you gave about buying the house for your son or daughter and your son or daughter then sublets the rooms, et cetera. Because I mean, again, the students themselves that's one instance where where there is a potential tax liability on the parents but what about the students themselves so for example if you've got kids who are studying but they also want to work or perhaps if they've been given an allowance would they themselves have to pay tax or does the tax burden fall exclusively on the shoulders of, of mum and dad well if the student is working then they're subject to tax and employment income or self-employment income the same as anybody else the other thing we see is okay if most double tax agreements will say that if parents or family provide maintenance and support to pay maybe the, the fees or the accommodation or living expenses, that's fine. But often you will, or occasionally, if you'll see for those with uh, more assets, they maybe put some assets into the name of the child so the child lives off the asset income. And that, of course, doesn't fall within the exemptions for maintenance. So it's these little things that can trip people up. Um, but again, it's only if you've got larger quantities of money that you need to worry, but that's exactly when you should start sure. worrying. But but if, for example, students actually, well, when they were, when they were a child, they had, had an allowance, and obviously mm. it, it increases as they get older, is that also taxable as well, particularly if they then go to university or-, or, or most, most double tax agreements have a section in there for students which say that payments for the maintenance and support of students, including payment of fees, isn't deemed to be taxable income in, in those countries. Usually you have to look at the double tax agreement between the country the family's coming from and the country where the child is studying. So you don't need to worry about those normally. 
Right, but that's where it pays to actually talk to an expert, expert because there is no universality in this. It's going to vary from one country to another. And every double tax agreement is subtly different, although most of them, that paragraph is pretty standard, but it, it, there needs to be a double tax agreement in place for that. Okay. And, and Scott, for those parents who, who want their children to graduate, with, not just with a degree, but also a passport, and we know that's possible through investment migration so that they can actually continue to live and, and work in the host country as long as they want, how early should that planning start? It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the ideal question, really, isn't it? Because you have to start planning early in a child's life for their education. And it's the tax planning if your kid wants to stay in the country where they've studied, where they've enjoyed living. They, want, they may want to have permanent citizenship further on down the line. So, Scott, that question's for you. Yeah, thanks, Juliet. So uh, it's important to note that you can only pass a citizenship down to future generations, not a residence. And in many of the places that uh, students would want to study overseas, having a permanent residence still requires them to spend a significant amount of time in that country to maintain the residence. So Oftentimes, the best case scenario is the child is able to naturalize and get a citizenship. This takes a lot of time. So if the parent can set the child up to start naturalizing on the first year of their undergraduate degree, then they will have a lot more flexibility because they will get that passport sooner. Canada, for example, you need to spend three out of five years. The United States, more than half the year every year for five years. So again, starting from the beginning, they'll have more flexibility. And these countries that have very attractive um, schools, sometimes they can take two to three years for the Residence by Investment Program to be approved. So parents need to start having these discussions with their kids when they start goal setting of where they want to go to school, what their ambitions are. So maybe even as early as grades nine and grades 10. Okay, then. Jose, I'm conscious of the fact that you've been sitting there listening, <laughs> nodding away. I have not deliberately enjoying the conversation. You, so, so please don't be offended. But look, you wrote an essay in which you talked about the cumulative effect of investment migration programs. Can you explain to us what does that mean? What were the key points that you were trying to highlight in that essay? Uh, that's a great question, Juliet. Um, well, what we mean uh, by the cumulative effect is that these country, countries that have um, my investment migration programs offer a different set of opportunities than uh, if you, for children, if you remain in your country. As Scott mentioned, uh, you know, there is a wage uh, differential between these uh, migration countries and, and other countries. Um, and what the uh, cumulative effect um, uh, does is that uh, through um, offering all these set of opportunities to live in a country with, uh, for example, high potential earnings, uh, better quality of life, um, it gives the children uh, uh, an advantage. Uh, because if they remain in these countries, they, they offer um, the potential to uh, sustain current wealth, generate a further wealth, and um, at the same time, protect uh, the networks that these uh, families can uh, generate. And following on from that, what, what do you see as the parameters that need to be considered when evaluating the cumulative value of investment migration? Because again, it's one of these things that has to be factored into parental planning. There's no getting away from it. Exactly. Um, well, we use the, the uh, Henley Opportunity Index to assess this community, uh, cumulative effect. Uh, there's, uh, as Scott mentioned in the beginning, there are several parameters that we use, um, including earning potential, uh, we have career development, which is uh, the extent to which, you know, uh, living in a country can foster professional development. Uh, we also have top tier employment prospects. Um, you know, the, it, that's the likelihood of finding employment with uh, a highly rep reputable company. We also have the premium education uh, parameter, which is, you know, the efficiency or effectiveness of the educational system. 
And of course, we have economic mobility, which means that you know um, having a, a second passport or a residence, a permanent residence in one of these uh, countries offer the child the ability to move through uh, different countries. For example, if you settle in Spain, uh, you can you have access to twenty seven countries through which you know you can search for better opportunities, employment opportunities. Another uh, um, uh, parameters that we we already mentioned is high li uh, livability, which means that you know these countries have greater um, uh, quality of life, better the health systems, and of course uh, higher levels of safety and security. We group this, we aggregate this into one. Um, uh, uh, we can call it an index, or, or, which is called the total opportunity score. Um, we also take into account for the cumulative effect, the number of universities um, that are in the, the top 250 globally in these countries. What I want to do just for one brief moment, because there are quite a few things within that answer, which I, I want to put to you, Jose, is just to break off, just to remind our audience that we want you to be part of this conversation. So please don't hesitate. If there are any questions or comments that you would like to put to the panel, please send them in using the Q&A facility on Zoom. Some of you have been doing that already, for which we're very grateful. And we will try to get through as many of those questions as we can at the end of this panel discussion. So please don't be shy. Do submit your questions or observations. We want to hear from you to make sure that this is as broad a conversation as we can muster. Jose, let me take it back to you because look, I want to maintain this focus on the compounding effect of investment migration by looking at two examples. Let's start with example one. You touched on this briefly, but what are the benefits for a child from let's say Indonesia and their parents decide that they want to go for Portugal's golden visa program? What are the advantages there? Um, well, there is this set of advantages. So if the child is young, uh, let's say there is um, a primary school uh, a child, a child uh, it will almost um, um, increase uh, by doubling the uh, premium education access for the child. Now, as the child grows older and uh, he, um, he or she starts thinking about their new potential, moving from Indonesia to Portugal, uh, doubles uh, the score in, in the earning potential uh, parameter. At, in, in terms of career development, it almost triples that score. So, uh, you know, when we look at the uh, livability, for example, there is a 20 point difference between Indonesia and Portugal, with Portugal having a 61 score, 61 point score, and, and Indonesia a 41 um, score. So, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of the, the total um, opportunity score that I mentioned previously, um, by investing in, 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 in these programs in Portugal, the parents of the child will be uh, doubling the, this score from the 25 that Indonesian uh, achieves to the 52 that Portugal has. Okay, let's take the same child, same set of parents. What is that difference? if the parents decide that they're going to increase their initial investment and instead of going into Portugal, but they're going to go to Spain instead. You did touch on that briefly about access points over 20 to 200. I can't remember the exact figure, but I'm sure that you can actually correct me on that. But you know, what are the advantages there and how is that move or how would a move to Spain affect the future prospects of their child? Well, by doing that, uh, Spain uh, offers greater uh, opportunities for career development. It, uh, it has an advantage of 18 points over Portugal, and it also has uh, uh, an advantage of about 18 uh, to 15 points uh, on the top tier employment access. Uh, in terms of um, um, career, uh, I mean, earning potential and high livability, they're very close. But it, uh, when it comes to economic mobility, the, the difference between Portugal and, and, and Spain is 20 points, uh, with Spain having almost a perfect score with 93 uh, out of 100. So, uh, you know, there is a, a greater um, 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 cumulative effect uh, if you move to Spain. Now, Spain has uh, one last advantage over Portugal, which 
it is that it offers access to four 250 top universities. Mm. So that, that is that advantage and, and the uh, minimum investment, the original investment um, um, is, there is a difference of about $250,000. What this really shows to me as the outsider looking in is that, that it is so difficult when you're trying to plan for your child's future. It seems so straightforward for my generation, but clearly <laughs> um, that was a long time ago. But look, Tess, let me take it back to you, because you know what? It's fitting that you started this discussion and um, therefore it seems logical that you should actually close it. Because look, what we're talking about here is a highly competitive education sector services sector. So from your perspective, what is it that sets Henley and Partners Education above the rest or sets it apart? Because it is a hugely competitive space. And let's be clear about this. There are a lot of parents who are very worried about the future. They want the best for their children in a world which, frankly, is very difficult to navigate. Absolutely. That's so true. And it's a really good question, because as, as much as Henley and Partners are sort of... Uh, a leader in their space, in their core, um, their core offering of, of citizenship and residency by investment, education services, as you've said, there are thousands. However, I'd say there are three things really that set us apart. One is that we're a team of educators, and that means that we have all worked in international education around the world, and it's uh, the team is made up of ex head teachers, principals, admissions directors, college counselors, teachers, special educational need um, specialists. And so, and, and they focus on individual geographical areas. So don't, we don't have one person who knows everything about everyone. We have one person who focuses on Australia, somebody else who focuses on Canada or the States or the EU, et cetera. And, and, because we understand the child, children, because we are from an education background, we understand the development, their needs, how they grow, and we offer bespoke services that are really tailored to the family. So we take the time to get to know them. We understand the child's aspirations academically, personally, and professionally, because this ensures that we can help them, as going back to what Alistair said earlier, they have to go to the right school or university for them, not mm. for anyone else, just for that child. And that leads into the second point, and we, that we are impartial, and this is quite rare. The majority of people who work in the education services space take commissions. We have no affiliations at all. Therefore, we really do work for the benefit of the child and the family. That's it. And then lastly, of course, although we are, um, we are a standalone service, we are the only education services provider who, alongside Henley, can offer um, students the possibility of graduating with both a degree and either residency or citizenship. And this, as Scott has explained and as Jose has explained, is an incredible gift that parents can offer their children because it opens a world of opportunities that may simply not be on offer in their home country. So by having multi citizenships or different citizenships, it becomes a multi generational gift for that child. Mm. And, and that's so important as well, the multi generational aspect, because you can plan for your child today, but you're also giving them yeah. a very important template for the future when they have to plan for their own children. And the other point, which I'm, I'm really sort of was, was felt so reassured of hearing there is, is this idea of bespoke and special needs, mm. because we should never forget that there are children who do oh, have yeah. special needs and those needs should be met. OK, because they deserve the same opportunities as, as other children. And it's great to know that that recognition does exist. So at this point, what I'm going to do is to say thank you to the panel for an incredibly interesting conversation. But I am not letting you go. What I'm going to say to you is just take a deep breath and relax. OK, we've had a great conversation. It's been very, very lively because it's that point in proceedings when we take questions from our webcast audience. And a reminder again, there's plenty of time. So if there are any points, questions, comments that you want to put to the panel, remember you can do so using the Q&A facility on Zoom. And a big thank you to those of you who've started doing that already. We will tackle those questions. And the other point to the panel as well is that we do not do hesitations. When I put a question out there, jump on it, take it. Because if you don't, Scott, then I'm afraid I'm going to nominate you.
<laughs> I think you will get where I'm coming from. So panel, are you ready to take those questions? Oh. Fantastic. Excellent. In actual fact, Scott, this first question is directed to you, but please, to the rest of the panel, do feel free to answer that if there's something that you want to add. The question is, it's directed to Scott's comment about education consultants. How are you working within client countries to offer advice? I think Tess would be best positioned to answer this. <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to say that, Scott. Thank you. We've got a game of tennis but I think going he's probably, on here. To be honest, he's right. And it actually feeds on quite well from my last comment uh, or the last question you asked me. And, and we don't focus on we we don't focus on one one suits all. You know, we we have, as I said, our our, our team specialise in different areas. So you know, we have, as I said, we have one specifically for Singapore. Just Singapore. We have others for the states and Canada. We have others for the EU. Obviously, the countries such as you know, we we are um, the majority of our expertise. I would say is are in the sort of well-known countries for education. So North America, uh, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and also the UAE, Singapore. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to add to that at all? I mean, Alistair, from your perspective, do you think you can offer up some advice here in response to that question? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, uh, when we're talking about education internationally, and particularly at university level, um, there are certain benchmarks that education consultants take, um, and they certainly look to, as uh, Dr. Jose um, talked about earlier, um, uh, the top 250 um, universities um, around the world as a benchmark of standards in academic um, um, expectations. And so the consultants are very well versed in the expectations of those top universities, those top learning spaces, and will be applying that no matter where the um, client is coming from, where the child has studied previously um, in terms of what those aspirations are and what the best possible places might be. OK, fantastic. Let's move on now to another question. Let me tell you something that this Q&A function is on fire. So clearly this is a big subject which a lot of people have feelings about they want to know. OK, let's move on to this question here. In your view, is it easier to get into the top Oxbridge or Ivy League universities mm -hmm. if you are a resident or have citizenship of the United Kingdom or the United States? What weighting or preference do they give to citizens versus foreign student application. So who would like to tackle that one, please? I'm happy to jump in on that. Um, I have to say that's an interesting question and I get asked that quite a lot and it's not that simple to answer. I would say that officially they don't have a waiting. However, let's if we look at Oxbridge, they have a lot of international applicants, they have a lot of national applicants. What is very interesting, and, and for the Ivy Leagues and the top universities in the States, they are now looking to diversify where they take their students from. So it's not just, oh, well, if, if my child goes to Eton or one of the top schools in the States, that does not guarantee anymore that they're automatically going to get accepted to Oxbridge or to the Ivies. What they look at now is how can we help those students who are coming from a different background, because we want to represent a wider, a wider community of people. So that in itself, that has quite an impact on it. Um, although, as I said earlier, the data officially, they don't have any preferences. But, you know, if I, I, I looked at some data from MIT, for instance, and it's just it's quite clear that there is a larger percentage of of uh, domestic, as I say, US students who are accepted than international. The other thing that they may look at is the number of nationalities that they have already recruited for that academic year. So there are all sorts of factors that enter into this. Um, it's not straightforward, but I think it's certainly, you know, you, you just have to go with being the best possible person you are for that university. And Oxbridge, mm is a longer preparation than the majority of UK universities. It, it is more complex. So, I, you know, we tend to suggest 18 months 
Sure. At so, least for Oxbridge. Yeah. Sound, sound advice as well, because I, mean, I, I hate to have to bring this in and I don't want to go down that road. Politics is also impacting of students coming in yeah. from abroad as well. So that's another Absolutely one of those is. rogue elements that has to be taken into mm -hmm. account. Is there anybody else who would like to add to what they have heard from Tess before I move on to the next question? No? OK, then that's fine. This is turning into the test show because Tess, this, this question is also for you as well. But that is no excuse for the rest of our panellists to stay silent or to disappear from the screen. I know I had them. to a few moments ago because I had a few technical issues here. But but again, Tess, if you can handle this question and again, mm -hmm. I would encourage other panellists to add to it if they wish. How do you offer education advising services in so many different regions, mm -hmm. given the nuances of the curriculums and locations, etc.? Which countries are you strongest in for education mm -hmm. advising? Yeah, yeah, I think to a degree I answered that question previously because um, we are certainly our focus, as I said, are in the key um, areas, the key countries for top you know, uh, top education provision, which is, as I said, North America, Europe, Canada, Australia, uh, yeah, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, I'm sure I've forgotten Europe, European countries. But our, our, as I said, our specialists, they are focusing on different countries. So mm. you know, we we and we don't if we if we can't help. If we don't have the expertise to be able to assist, and this is a, this has happened, we've said no. You know, if, I, if we don't have somebody who can help within a country, if we don't have that um, specialism, then we won't we won't be able to help because I refuse to say we can and then not deliver. Mm, honesty is the best policy. Okay, if, if I could just add on, on to yes, that go one. for it. No, Absolutely, go for it. The, the bit of the question there I really like is about the nuances of curriculums. Mm in, in yeah. specific locations. And I think it's a great question from that in that regard. Yeah. When we um, uh, use academic profiling and assessment, um, we're, the, the, the uh, expertise and, and the real strength of the conversation with the education team is really about the interpretation of that profile of those academic results in the context of where they might want to be looking to get to, um, and um, that's where the real value in the interpretation is. We don't just present, pr um, provide a, a report, a, a piece of data, and say, you know, you, you, you look at that information and, 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 and do what you will with it. It's that interpretation that the consultant brings to say, well, if you're looking at these um, places in the distant future or in the near future, these are the things you should be considering, and these are the considerations you might want to make going into this learning environment out of your own. And that's the wonderful thing about having that data in the in, in the first instance to facilitate that conversation in an international context. The HAPA results are based on a, a UK US expectation in terms of academic abilities, um, but the, the uh, experts that Henley has can also apply those to a PISA, so an international um, educational expectation as well, um, all through their interpretation. And that's real. That's the real value there. Okay, thank you so much for that, can, Alistair. Please go for it, Tess. I'm really sorry. Can I just jump in? Because the other thing that's quite important about the curriculum element of it is that we assist students when we're talking about schools, not universities. Um, we assist students going into international education or private schools. We don't work with state schools because for exactly this reason, it's totally different. So we work... So the international schools tend to have British curriculum, American curriculum, IB, um, and obviously the younger curriculum as well. So that is a global, that's recognised global, and that's why we get around that, because you're quite right. Um, the person who asked that question, it's a really good one. And as um, Alistair's rightly explained, the nuances are huge, but um, international schools, private schools, they tend to deliver similar things. Mm, OK, thank you so much for that as well, that clarification, the international and the state school sector. Really good question here, which um, I would I would actually like some of our other panellists to to tackle this, because I do think that Tess and Alistair, they need to rest themselves a little bit. But look, great question. Would my children have to renounce their birth citizenship if I participate in one of these programmes? Scott, would you like to handle that? Certainly. So. Countries are one of two ways. You can either hold as many passports as you want, or you can only hold one citizenship. So 
of course, some students wouldn't have the flexibility of actually naturalizing and getting the second status, the second passport that they could pass down to future generations. So if that's the situation we find ourselves in, but we still want to have something that is relatively permanent and has flexibility, we can look at countries that offer a permanent residence that doesn't require much maintenance visits. For example, in the United Kingdom, their indefinite leave to remain is pretty much indefinite. You only need to visit for one day every two years to maintain this status. Or if your uh, investor visa is attached to an asset, for example, a property in Spain or a property in Greece, as long as the property is held, the uh, residence visa can be maintained. So that would be a way to uh, achieve some level of permanence without having to give up your birth passport. Mm. So, and, and it's, it's interesting that you talked about countries which actually offer that flexibility, okay? What about sort of upcoming countries, so to speak? Because we, we last week, for example, we, well, the pre a few weeks earlier, in fact, we, we had a webinar about uh, the BRIC countries, the BRICs, and again, the, the economic performance really attractive. Are these countries which perhaps offer that similar degree of flexibility? Because presumably it will be in their interest as well to make themselves attractive to, to people. Yeah, so I, again, each country has their individual rules and a lot of these countries with vibrant growing economies, they actually would not allow you to hold multiple nationalities. Now, things are starting to get more relaxed in general, and it is becoming more and more common to allow people to hold dual nationality because this helps countries inevitably attract talent to come back, to settle, and to invest and create jobs. Um, but Again, for people that don't want to lose the passport, they, they may have to um, consider, again, programs or countries that give permanence with their, their permanent residence. And again, not all countries do this. For example, if you're a permanent resident in Canada, you still need to spend two out of every five years to maintain that. Where I live in Singapore, permanent residence is not permanent. If you do not spend time in Singapore, eventually they will not renew your reentry permit. So these are all things that we can consult on with families when they're looking at options. Okay, fantastic. Is there anybody else who would like to add to that before we move on to another question? No? Okay, then. Can you give me some insights for international education opportunities for South Africans? I refer to trends in country selection, stats for success or successful or unsuccessful placement, degree course selection who would like to tackle that one it's it's very country specific <laughs> does anyone feel brave enough to tackle that one? Oh dear to well to the person who sent that question i think it's fair to say that you have stumped us on that one but i'm sure that um, a member of the henley and partners team will yeah, get that I to can. You. Oh, you're, you're going to give Sorry, it a go i i was on mute when i was i saying beg that. your pardon okay so tess is going <laughs> to give it a go yeah, um, so we've got one of our uh, one of our team is actually South African and um, lives in South Africa in the state. She she moves between the two and she works with South African students. And the one thing that you know is worth knowing is if if you have a child who can do the IB or a British curriculum or an American curriculum in one of the schools over in the private schools in South Africa, you'll have a slightly larger choice of universities. Now, the matric, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the exam that they will do in South Africa, their national curriculum is not accepted in, I'm gonna, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Oxbridge and UCL and I think potentially LSE. I know, I don't quote me on that. I know that there are certain universities in the UK that don't accept it. So if this is something a family discovers right at the end of their child's education and all they want to do is to apply to these universities, they don't, I, I will need to check that. So please do not quote me on that, but they are certainly some of the top universities, but it's only two or three. <laughs> The, U the US is quite a popular destination and the US colleges in general do accept the national curriculum, the South African curriculum. Um, 
I always suggest to families if they can look at doing a more international um, curriculum such as IB, which is recognized globally by all universities and they really have every single door open. Um, I don't have stats for successful or unsuccessful placement. I think the degree in the course selection, again, it really does depend on whether they're doing the national curriculum or a, or a, a more recognized curriculum globally. But they move, South Africans certainly do travel to study abroad. Right. But the key thing to remember from this, and this is to the person who sent in that question, thank you so much, is that Henley and partners are there. They have experts in the field of South African education. So yeah. any questions that you have, you can put it to them and they will direct you to the right people who can work with you because it is a journey. It doesn't just start um, when a child goes to university. It's, it, there's a lot of planning, as we've learned beforehand. So please do talk to Henley and Partners for those with, with, a bit, with that interest in South Africa. Let's move on to another question. Again, I'm going to throw it out to the panel. So please do feel free to take it, whoever. Which programmes have the quickest process to obtain residency? And does the family have to move to the country? Scott, that's a question which appears to have your fingerprints all over it. <laughs> <laughs> indeed it does Juliet so the most popular uh programs are indeed countries that are reasonably quick in terms of approval but most importantly they don't have uh large residency requirements generally our clients are looking to change as little as possible with their day-to-day -day life perhaps their executives business owners they want to stay where they're income is where their businesses are and where their families are so in saying that the quickest programs for approval at least in europe tend to be either spain or greece there are some delays in portugal right now but we do uh, anticipate that the government will be taking some steps within the next few months to solve uh, this bottleneck and, and fix these delays Okay, and Peter, I can't help thinking about the tax implications on that one. <laughs> well, I think, you know, as I say, if the family moves, I mean, the, what we're talking about today is about just the student moving and the, getting the resident for investment by the student. And again, moving the whole family there is um, not it, you know, is not strictly necessary. And of course, the other point, which I should have made somewhere along the way, is when we talk about residency from this perspective, that's the legal right to live in the country. That is utterly different from tax residency and probably 80% of the calls I have on this. My starting comment is just because you're a resident doesn't mean you're tax resident. And just because you're tax resident doesn't mean you're allowed to be resident. So uh, this is the first thing to get sorted out there, definitely. Oh, th thank you so much for clarifying that. We, I think we all know from our own experience of tax regulations that it is a bit of a tangle, but um, at least you're, you're bringing some sense to it, Peter. So thank you for mm -hmm. that as well. And, and uh, Dr. Caballero, it's interesting to see that Portugal, again, emerging as one of the favourite places to go, despite the, the bottleneck that Scott referenced there in his answer. It is, indeed. I, I, I'm actually planning to retire there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can guess why. <laughs> <laughs> Not soon enough, though. Um, I, I can, uh, I mean, we, we, from my personal experience with my daughter, uh, she decided to study in the UK, uh, and we were living here. And, um, and she has two nationalities already, so it is quite, uh, it can become an issue uh, in the long run. So I, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's a good idea to, to consult in this in this uh, possibilities mm -hmm. way ahead. Uh, she's planning to apply for the Swiss uh, citizenship. So uh, luckily the US has uh, a two nationalities uh, rule in my country, El Salvador also has that, but she has to give up one of them. Mm. So, uh, you know, consulting way ahead is, is, is a better way to go about it. And it's, it's interesting you say that because we have a question here. It doesn't, it, it hasn't been expanded. It's just one sentence. What is the maximum, what, what is the maximum age the child could be? And it's, it's, it's pretty open-ended, but um, again, I'm just throwing this out to everybody, but it, it really comes back to the beginning of our conversation that there is no ideal age. Once you have a child, every parent wants to think about their child's education. So the sooner you plan, the better. I mean, 
I'm sure that some of you are parents, but when did you start planning? I mean, starting with you, Dr. Caballero, I mean, what, what was the ideal age that you chose? Uh, yeah, I think we started planning one once uh, we came here to Switzerland. So it's, uh, my daughter was about eight, uh, nine, 10 years old, uh, because we knew that she, will, since we, were, we lived in the UK and the US previously, we somehow knew that she would want to go back. So the, the planning age was nine years, uh, 10 years old. Mm. Is that about average Tess, Tess and Alistair? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, it, it's, it's, it's from, from a support point of view, the earlier you start, you, you can work with the family, the better um, because of getting um, uh, all the things in place around that child um, to, to help them get to where they want to go. Um, just a very quick one-liner in terms of how um, the HAPA um, assessment can, can support children and what ages they can be. Reassess yeah. students from 6 to 18, all the way up to 18. So, so um, uh, yeah, uh, th th there's, there's a wide range of, of, of uh, ch ch children's ages that we can work with. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess, and, the, sorry, do, do go on, Tess, go for it. Yeah, I was just going to sort of continue with what Alistair was saying. And because the, what the HAPA does, because we obviously haven't gone into any detail of, of this assessment, but it, it, it delivers a report that is then discussed with the child if they're old enough, but obviously the parents, and it breaks down the, the what's assessed into subskills. So it can be used by the parents very much as sort of internal document for the family. So they can see where their child may or may not need help and very specifically within each subject. So let's say maths, it could be that they're not great at maths, but actually it's, they are pretty good at maths, but there are a couple of areas that could need work. So we can work with the family to advise them on either how they can get more specific support from the school, or they can reach out to tutors. But the others, and, and then following on from that, nothing to do with HAPA, maybe what this person means is how old are the children that we work with children? I put in inverted commas, because in fact, we can in certain, countries assist with uh, students who want to do masters and uh, potentially MBAs as well. Mm. Again, I was actually going to ask you about that as well, children who want yeah, to go beyond can. the Bachelor of Arts. Yeah, yeah. but it, it does, it is a case by case basis because it's slightly more specific. We don't tend to assist with PhDs at all. Um, however, we, you know, we, we are currently working with a, a Swiss national who are doing an Australian um, visa application and they have a 26 year old son who's very dyslexic and is currently working in uh, as a paramedic in Switzerland and they want to put him through university in Australia so he can be qualified to work and he's 26. Mm. And, and what I thought, thought was really interesting again it's a point which came out with, with you too Alistair is the fact that when you're planning the children's education you're talking about there about the HAPA test that the kids get involved in that conversation. Mm. That oh, in yeah. itself, it's, it's fascinating that you're, you're, mm. you're seeing a turnaround because I'm from the generation where children were seen but not heard and we were told. And um, things seem to be flipped on their head. But look, if we're planning for your education, you're going to be the beneficiaries of this. And it's important that you should be involved in structuring things too. Absolutely. That, this is something that we're, that we're seeing as, as, as um, we as a, as a society are becoming more uh, data literate um, and evidence um, literate um, that the expectation is that the, the children are too but if you can empower them with an understanding of their own learning and their own strengths and their own challenges then um, it really helps point them in the right direction um, it, they become active in, in, in the whole process and you're absolutely right we've talked about trajectory in the past um, you can really get them onto a track where they feel very much part of that process, as opposed to um, uh, being passive in all of this. No, um, bring them, bring them along on the journey, because um, it's going to be much better for everyone in that in that sense. I couldn't agree with you more. We've got a few more minutes to go, in fact, before we close out this discussion. So let's see if we can race our way through these questions. We've got one here. Are all of Henley and Partners educational specialists based in the United Kingdom, or are they dispersed globally? Well, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> 
from what we've heard that um, you are an international lot isn't yeah. that correct <laughs> yeah we are an international lot we we are certainly there are several of us in the UK I'm based in the UK but I'm currently sitting in a hotel room in Hong Kong um so I travel a lot anyway but we have a, you know our teams are in Canada in Asia in Singapore in Switzerland in the US mm -hmm. in Portugal too <laughs> yeah. and, and, that, and that's as yeah, not, just the, all over the place. not just the experts for education as well let's not forget the experts on citizenship and also yeah. for taxation too because remember the two things you, you can't really separate separate them all out you can't just isolate the education and just focus on that there are other elements that you have to take into account so let's have another question here I'm looking for undergraduates from ETZ Zurich Uni for my kid appreciate your guidance or what is the other option to get PR of Switzerland recently I read that if you pay required tax it can make you stay in Switzerland now yes Peter you're punching the air in triumph <laughs> finally a tax question <laughs> finally a tax question yes absolutely it's, uh, do you know it, what patience is a virtue Okay, yeah, so like, patience um, has been rewarded. So why don't we start with you, Peter, and then Scott, and then let's bring in the other panel panelists. Oh, okay. I mean, Switzerland does have a residence by investment scheme, but it's very bespoke and uh, individualized. It's not like the other countries where if you invest X, you will get the right to live there. Um, it, there is a, um, a, a program there. It's very specific there. It is to encourage people to go and live there and spend their money there and not necessarily to, uh, to to move all their operations there or to work from there. So yes, you can get yourself into Switzerland as a, as a Swiss resident, whether that helps your child get into Swiss university. The two things are, as Tess said earlier, are quite independent, you know, whether you, you get preference to be a university because of your citizenship or not. So um, yes, there is something that can make you tax resident Switzerland, but that may or may not be an option to help your child get into ETZ or not. Um, so that's, you know, if you try and mix up too many issues at the same time, you know, I always find it better just to deal with them one by one. You know, try, what's the best way to get into ETZ is the first question. Do you want to be tax resident Switzerland? That's another question. Do we put those two together and does it help? Let's put that, let's do that afterwards. But um, yeah, let's not mix them two up and try and do one thing by trying to do something else. Okay, Scott, you're chomping at the bit. Indeed, Juliet. Well, Switzerland is a is an interesting one. Obviously, Central Europe, but not part of the European Union. So, if you were to, let's say, invest to obtain a, a passport in Malta, that doesn't mean that you can use that to settle in Switzerland, because again, it's not part of the EU. So, how can you uh, invest and gain legal residence in Switzerland? Well. I must say it's it's rather uh, efficient and logical. We're a Swiss company. We have Swiss executives, and uh, I think it, it fits the mold very well. You need to negotiate a lump sum tax agreement with an individual canton in Switzerland, and you need to pay this lump sum tax on an annual basis. So this is by no means a uh, affordable uh program it is certainly aimed towards high net worth ultra high net worth individuals and the lowest um lump sum and this this may have gone up um since since i last had my information but the lowest lump sum tax agreement we see generally is around i think 250,000 swiss francs per annum well <laughs> I'm, I'm going to state now I don't have that sort of money, so I don't think I'll be investing in a Swiss canton anytime soon. Dr. Caballero, would you like to add to that? And I'm going to throw it out to Tess and Alistair to close. If there's anything else you wish to add? Uh, well, I can only, uh, um, I don't have the 250,000 either, so <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can only speak of what the, it is said. I think um, um, if, if, uh, in, personally, I believe that settling in the U.S. is easier than it is in Switzerland. Uh, and the U.S. has a couple of universities uh, that actually compete straight with the ETZ. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Caltech and MIT. Um, I'm a product of the United States educational system and the U.K. system. So I, I, I think it's, 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 it's a... Um, 
Personally, I believe that the uh, the U.S. option will be a much better route in this in this case. Okay. Final words, Tess and and Alistair. <laughs> I was just going to say, of all the you know, ET said you're a very competitive university, and then there's Swiss education and in itself is quite complicated. So Switzerland is the one country I am not going to give huge amounts of information on because I rely heavily on the people that we work with in our team who do know all about Switzerland. So um, with regards to that question, I would most definitely suggest you come back and contact me. But um, there are all sorts of different little nuances about Switzerland and their universities. So. I think it's probably further contact would be better. Alistair, I don't know if you want to add to that. Okay. No, I think you very um, diplomatically uh, covered that from, <laughs> from my perspective as well. Thank you, Kate. Tess. Do you know what this? We have really uh, generated so such a strong um, response here to to this webinar, which I'm delighted about. I was going to close out. We've got a few more minutes. We have a, a question here from um, a person I believe in, in Nigeria, but they basically say, what opportunities are available for my 17 year old son, presently an undergraduate in the Department of Physiology in Nigeria, to study medicine in Canada upon graduation in 2026 and get an employment opportunity? Let's make this the last question. Who would like to tackle that one? You've all gone suddenly very shy and quiet. Well yeah I can jump in again but I think I might be getting a bit boring <laughs> you, you are never boring Tess mm, well um so what I would say is from for his age if he's 17 now he's obviously mm. studying 26 he's got heaps of time to look at Canada what I'd suggest is that again that they uh, the family reaches out to me because we could set up a call with um, one of our Canadian specialists who can advise. Medicine is always a bit of a tricky one. Some countries, some universities are quite open to taking international students. But going back to that question of, you know, taking in different students from different countries versus domestic students, medicine can be one where they're very tricky about it because it's such an expensive undertaking to train a doctor mm. most countries don't want to spend huge amounts of money and for them to leave so it's usually far harder for international students to get into right. medicine but it's always worth a conversation yeah which is yes yeah, so, and that's absolutely correct so the invitation is out there as well that um this 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 person that if you want to to follow this up then please yeah. do contact henley and co they will have or henley and partners they will have the, the team who can who will be there to help you with your son's planning and he's 17 so you've chosen the right time to pursue this conversation I'm now going to close out but before I do we've also had um, a message from one of the uh, webcast viewers so thank you so much for that and it's to you Scott and it says thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> that's major day that's fantastic but look we are going to close out because sadly time is the enemy, but I'd like to thank the panel because you really have been wonderful. We've had a lively conversation and above all informative. You've connected with our audience and we can we know this from the calibre of the questions which have come through. And we hope that um, you, our audience, have found this extremely helpful as well because it is very difficult when you're planning your child's education, knowing when to start and at what point it is safe to, you've got your child where you want them to be so you can actually pull back. But look, the experts are there, we know that and they are more than happy to make the time to talk this through with you because they understand how difficult it is. And also as well, it is worth finding out more about the Henley Education report it has been recently published so it will tell you all the information that you need to know so again thank you so much my global online audience and to our experts have a great day to everybody and i hope to see you again in the not too distant future stay safe wherever you are Bye.